Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's return to a deliciously relaxing book, The History of Bread, From Prehistoric to Modern Times, by John Ashton. First published in 1904 by the Religious Tract Society of London. Let's pick up right where we left off some time ago, toward the end of Chapter 7, Early English Bread. Let's begin. Much early legislation was passed regarding bakers and their calling, but in spite of it all, some bakers did not amend their ways, and an amusing grievance was made by Fabian as to their punishment. In his Chronicles, under date of 1268, and speaking of the harshness of Sir Hugh Bigod, Justice, he says, In process of time after, the said Sir Hugh, with others, came to Guild Hall, and kept his court and pleas there without all order of law, and contrary to the liberties of the city, and there punished the bakers for lack of size by the tumbrel, where before times they were punished by the pillory, and ordering many things at his will, more than by any good order of law. And Hollinshead repeats the story. Nor were the misdeeds confined to their trade, as we may learn from the archives of the City of London. In fact, their evil deeds were so notorious that the king himself had to take cognizance of them. That the bakers wanted looking after is well evidenced by extracts from the city archives. In A.D. 1298, it is said, be it remembered that on Wednesday next, after the Feast of St. Lawrence, August 10th, in the 26th year of the reign of King Edward, Juliana, the baker of Newington, brought a cart laden with six shillings worth of bread into West Cheap, of which bread, that which was light bread, was wanting in weight, according to the assize of the halfpenny loaf, to the amount of twenty-five shillings in weight, the shilling of silver being three-fifths of an ounce in weight, this deficiency would be fifteen ounces, and of the said six shillings worth, three shillings worth was brown bread, which brown bread was of the right to seize. It was therefore adjudged that the same should be delivered to the aforesaid Juliana, by Henry Legales, Mayor of London, Thomas Romaine, and other aldermen, and the other three shillings worth, by a ward of the said Mayor of Aldermen, was ordered to be given to the prisoners in Newgate. In 1311, the bread taken from William de Somerset Baker on the Thursday next before the Feast of St. Lawrence, 10th of August, in the fifth year of the reign of King Edward II, was examined and adjudged upon before Richard de Rexham, Mayor, Thomas Romaine, John de Wengrave, and other aldermen. And because it was found that such bread was putrid and altogether rotten and made of putrid wheat, so that persons by eating that bread would be poisoned and choked, the sheriff was ordered to take him and have him here on the Friday next after the Feast of St. Lawrence, then to receive judgment for the same. In 1327, 
a curious fraud was brought to light, and John Bride and seven other bakers and two bakeresses were tried before the mayor and aldermen, for that the said John, for falsely and maliciously obtaining his own private advantage, did skillfully and artfully cause a certain hole to be made upon a table of his, called a molding board pertaining to his bakehouse, after the manner of a mouse trap in which mice are caught, there being a certain wicket warily provided for closing and opening such hole. And when his neighbors and others who were wont to bake their bread at his oven came with their dough or material for making bread, the said John used to put the said dough or other material upon the said table, called a molding board, as aforesaid, and over the hole before mentioned, for the purpose of making loaves therefrom for baking. And such dough or material being so placed upon the a table aforesaid, the same John had one of his household, ready provided for the same, sitting in secret beneath such table, which servant of his so seated beneath the hole, and carefully opening it, piecemeal and bit by bit, craftily withdrew some of the dough aforesaid, frequently collecting great quantities of such dough, falsely, wickedly, and maliciously, to the great loss of all his neighbors and persons living near, and of others who had come to him with such dough to bake, and to the scandal and disgrace of the whole city, and in especial of the mayor and bailiffs, for the safe keeping of the assizes of the city assigned, which whole so found in his table aforesaid, was made of a forethought, and in like manner a great quantity of such dough that had been drawn through the said hole was found beneath the hole, and was by William de Herting, sergeant at Mace, and Thomas de Morley, clerk of Richard of Rothing, one of the sheriffs of the city aforesaid, who had found such material or dough in the suspected place before mentioned, upon oath, brought here into court. All the prisoners pleaded not guilty, but the case was too clear against them, and it was agreed and ordained that all those of the bakers aforesaid, beneath whose tables with holes dough had been found, should be put upon the pillory with a certain quantity of such dough hung from their necks, and that those bakers in whose houses dough was not found beneath the tables aforesaid should be put upon the pillory but without dough hung from their necks, and that they should so remain upon the pillory until vespers at St. Paul's in London should be ended." the women were committed to Newgate. There was another punishment by which bakers, in common with all who told lies or libeled or scandalized their neighbor, had to stand in the pillory with a whetstone hung round their neck. Chapter 8 How Grain Becomes Flour In order to make bread, the first operation is to grind the corn, be it wheat, rye, barley, or oats. And we have already seen the rough methods used by primitive man and others to effect this. We have noted the mealing stones, the pestle and mortar, the hand quern, and the grinding of corn by the Greeks and Romans, they soon gave up man as a motive power and substituted mules or horses. These in their time gave place to water, which is a cheap, and if there be anything like a fall, a very powerful motor. Hence the mills dotted all over the country by the side of brook or river, with their water wheels either over or under shot. Very picturesque are they mostly, and the drowsy murmur of the wheel, 
and the gentle splashing of the water are very pleasant. We are seeing the last of them. They have done their work and must be thrown aside, for no one in his senses who had water power would now erect water wheels when he could get a turbine. As with the water wheel, so its congener the windmill, beloved of artists, is going. A motive power as cheap as water is the wind, but unfortunately it is not so reliable. It is believed that the Chinese were the first to use the wind as a motive power for mills, and we have no record as to when they were introduced into Europe. We only know they were in use in the 12th century. As a rule, in England, windmills have four arms or whips, but sometimes they have six. These arms are generally covered with strong canvas, but occasionally they are covered with thin boarding. They are set at an angle, which varies according to the fancy of the miller but the shaft to which they are attached, called the wind shaft, is invariably placed at an inclination of 10 or 15 degrees, in order that the revolving arms should clear the bottom portion of the mill. The oldest kind of windmill is called a post mill, because the whole structure is centered on a post or pivot, and when the wind shifts, the mill has to be turned bodily to meet it by means of a long lever. The smock or frock windmill is an improvement upon the post mill. The building itself is stationary and permanent, but the head or cap, where is the wind shaft, rotates, and this is more easily managed. For hundreds of years, people were contented with the four and six arms to their windmills, and it was only in modern times that Messrs. J. Warner and Sons of Cripplegate, London, patented their annular sails, which, as is plain to the meanest capacity, are vastly superior. The shutters or vanes are connected with spiral springs which keep them up to the best angle of weather for light winds. If the strength of the wind increases, the vanes give to the wind, forcing back the springs, and thus the area on which the wind acts diminishes. In addition, there are a striking lever and tackle for setting the vanes edgeways to the wind when the mill is stopped or a storm expected. We have seen how from the very first man used stones wherewith to triturate his corn, and to this day stones are still used for grinding, although their days are in all probability numbered, and in a very little time they with the windmill will be relegated to limbo. The Encyclopedia Britannica gives such an excellent description of these millstones that I quote it in its entirety. They consist of two flat cylindrical masses enclosed within a wooden or sheet metal case, the lower or bedstone being permanently fixed, while the upper or runner is accurately pivoted and balanced over it. The average size of millstones is about 4 feet 2 inches in diameter by 12 inches in thickness, and they are made of a hard but cellular siliceous stone called burr stone, the best qualities of which are obtained from La ferté sous jarre Department of seine et marne France. Millstones are generally built up of segments bound together round the circumference by an iron hoop and backed with plaster of Paris. The bedstone is dressed to a perfectly flat, plain surface 
and a series of grooves or shallow depressions are cut in it, generally in the manner shown in the illustration left, which represents the grinding surface of an upper or running stone. The grooves on both are made to correspond exactly, so that when the one is rotated over the other, the sharp edges of the grooves, meeting each other, operate like a rough pair of scissors, and thus the effect of the stones on grain submitted to their action is at once that of cutting, squeezing, and crushing. The dressing and grooving of millstones is generally done by hand-picking, but sometimes black amorphous diamonds called carbonado are used, and emery wheel dressers have likewise been suggested. The upper stone or runner is set in motion by a spindle on which it is mounted, which passes up through the center of the bedstone, and there are screws and other appliances for adjusting and balancing the stone. Further provision is made within the stone case for passing through air to prevent too high a heat being developed in the grinding operation, and sweepers for conveying the flour to the meal spout are also provided. The ground meal delivered by the spout is carried forward in a conveyor or creeper box by means of an Archimedean screw to the elevators by which it is lifted to an upper floor to the bolting or flower dressing machine. The form in which this apparatus was formerly employed consisted of a cylinder mounted on an inclined plane and covered externally with wire cloth of different degrees of fineness, the finest being at the upper part of the cylinder where the meal is admitted. Within the cylinder, which was stationary, a circular brush revolved, by which the meal was pressed against the wire cloth, and at the same time, carried gradually towards the lower extremity, sifting out as it proceeded the mill products into different grades of fineness. For the operation of bolting or dressing, Hexagonal or octagonal cylinders, about 3 feet in diameter and from 20 to 25 feet long, are now commonly employed. These are mounted horizontally on a spindle for revolving, and externally they are covered with silk of different degrees of fineness, whence they are called silks or silk dressers. Radiating arms or other devices for carrying the meal gradually forward as the apparatus revolved are fixed within the cylinders, and there is also an arrangement of beaters which gives the segments of cloth a sharp tap and thereby facilitates the sifting action of the apparatus. Like all other mill machines, the modifications of the silk dresser are numerous. End quote. We have seen the ordinary operation of grinding flour in the old fashioned way. Now, let us notice the improvements in making wheat into flour. We will suppose that the wheat has arrived by lighter at one of the large mills on the Thames and that it has been shoveled into sacks and hoisted into the warehouse. The process by which it is turned into flour may be divided into three stages. 1. Cleaning 2. Breaking 3. Grinding But the number and complexity of the operations included in these stages are astounding. It must be understood that the following description refers to a first-class London mill, that is, one which has certainly no superior and probably no equal in the world. In the first stage, the wheat is merely prepared for the mill, and this is done in the cleaning department 
which is separate from the mill proper. From the warehouse, the grain is passed to a sifter or separator, which is a kind of sieve. Here the grosser impurities, straw, sticks, stones, earth, seeds, and what not, are removed. Thence to an elevator, precisely similar in principle to that previously described, and by the elevator straight to the top of the building. Here it enters a wire sieve in the form of a revolving hexagonal reel, by which the smaller heavy impurities with which it is still mixed are separated. Passing through this, it drops into the next story, to be subjected to the aspirator, an apparatus by means of which currents of air are blown through the grain as it falls, and carry off the lighter and more volatile rubbish mixed with it. In the next floor is an ingenious instrument with a special purpose. Among the wheat is still a quantity of small black seeds, known as cockle seeds, and to get rid of these, the cockle cylinder is employed. It is a revolving metal cylinder, the inner surface of which is fitted with small holes. The grain passes into the interior of the cylinder, and as the latter goes round and round, the cockle seeds stick in the small holes and are carried up to a certain height when they fall out and are caught by an apron, while the wheat, which is too large to stick in the holes, continually falls back into the bottom of the cylinder. Again our corn drops a story and encounters the decorsitator. The object of this apparatus is to knock off the dust and dirt adhering to the grains, and it is affected by agitating them between two metal surfaces at a high rate of speed. The amount of dust removed by this method from apparently clean grain is astonishing. In the next story is another decorsitator, and below that, a second aspirator, which brings us once more to the ground. On reaching the ground floor again, our now clean wheat is first passed through the grading or sizing reels, which separate it into two sizes, and then it enters the mill proper. It should be said here that the milling industry of the world has been revolutionized within the past few years by the substitution of steel rollers for the old millstones. The process of crushing or grinding, however, by steel rollers is accomplished in a very gradual manner, as will be explained. First come the brake rolls. These are solid steel rollers set in pairs with corrugated surfaces. This gives them a cutting action. Wheat is passed through five successive pairs of these rollers. The first are about one sixteenth inch apart and only break or bruise the grain slightly. Each successive pair is set closer and carries the bruising a step further. But this is only half the business. After each set of rollers, the grain goes through a purifier, which is either a sieve of some kind or an aspirator, or both together, and the object is always the same, namely to separate the solid particles of the broken wheat from the lighter ones. The former are, or rather will eventually be, flour, the latter constitute awful, and the whole art of milling is merely an extension of this process. First reduction, then separation, repeated over and over again. As the grain passes through each successive set of rollers, it is broken up finer and ever finer, 
and the separating action of the purifier accompanies it step by step. The solid particles grow smaller and smaller, the offal correspondingly finer and finer. This is the process in brief, but there are endless complications and refinements on the way. For instance, the solid particles are not only separated, but are themselves divided into groups according to size. Then the offal often undergoes a further purifying process. Then the purifiers differ. Some are complex, others simple. Some of wire, others of silk. Some revolve, others oscillate. Some are aspirated, others not, and so forth. Meanwhile, at the end of the five rolls and five purifiers, which make up our breaking department, we have got three products. A. Semolina B. Middlings C. Awful The first two are practically varieties of the same, i.e. both solid particles, which will afterwards be flour, but of different sizes. They are halfway between grain and flour, hence the term middlings. Grinding is only a continuation of the above process, but the rollers are different. Their surfaces are smooth and they are set closer together. The purifiers, too, are for the most part more elaborate. A look at one of them will show the extreme ingenuity expended on these operations. It consists primarily of an oscillating sieve made of silk, through the meshes of which the particles of flour fall into a wooden bin. On the floor of the bin is a worm, which continually works the flour along to one end. On the under surface of the sieve is a traveling brush, which brushes off the adhering flour and prevents the meshes from getting clogged. Above the sieve is an apparatus, which with the aid of currents blown by an aspirator, catches the volatile offal, and above that again a traveling blanket, which arrests the still more volatile particles. Finally, the blanket as it reaches the end is tapped automatically to knock out what has stuck to it. By the time a handful of grain has been converted into a handful of fine flour, it has gone through some 50 different machines, including 18 sets of rollers and 18 purifiers. The following points may be of interest. A first-class London mill working 100 sets of rollers can turn out 45 sacks of flour per hour. Awful, according to its fineness or coarseness, forms bran, pollard, etc., and is worth from 5 pounds to 6 pounds a ton. The qualities of flour are whiteness and strength. The former is tested by the eye, the latter only really by baking capacity. There seems to be a general consensus of opinion in flavor of flour made from Hungarian wheat. The best English is of sweeter flavor, but lacks strength. It has been reckoned that 300 sacks are made per hour in London mills, all of which is consumed in London. The flour mill industry owes nothing to American inventive genius. On the contrary, that country is behind the times. The steel rollers came originally from Hungary, always a great milling country. Chapter 9 The Miller and His Tolls In old times, corn mills were always important factors in manners and a source of considerable profit to the lord of the same. 
All the tenants of the manor were bound by custom to have their corn ground at the manor mill, paying a toll to the lord, for the mill was part of his domain. The tenants owed suit to the mill in the same manner as they owed suit and service at the manor court. This, however, did not apply to the grinding or bruising of malt, and there were probably two good reasons for it. One, that the tenants could perform the operation on their own premises, and the second, that if it were done at the mill, it would be likely to spoil the flour next ground. Very many instances of these mills may be given, but one will suffice, more especially as in this case it was carried down to modern times. There was at Wakefield, Yorkshire, a corn mill which was a franchise of the Pilkington family of Cheval Park by charters from one of the Edwards. The monopoly of grinding the corn at this mill was a great sore to the inhabitants and the cause of much litigation, but the holders of the rights always came off the victors. They claimed the right of grinding not only for the town of Wakefield, but for some miles around, including the villages of Horbury, Osset, New Millerdom, and others, so that all the corn used in this district was obliged to be ground at the Soak Mill, or as it was otherwise called, the King's Mill and neither meal nor flour could be sold unless it were ground there. The tenant of the mill demanded a mulcture of one-sixteenth, that is, out of sixteen sacks of corn, he kept one for himself, for grinding the other fifteen. Sometime about 1850, the inhabitants of Wakefield and the adjacent villages determined to purchase the rights, and this was done by a rate spread over a series of years, and called the Soak Rate. The purchase money amounted to about £20,000. The same kind of property existed at Leeds and at Bradford, but from neglect on the part of the owners and lapse of time, the inhabitants turned restive and independent, and broke the Soak without compensating the lords of the manors. These mills are still called the King's Mills. Nor was this custom confined to England. In Scotland in feudal times, it was common for the tenants of a barony to be bound to have their corn ground at the barony mill. Centuries ago, the erection of a substantial building with the millstones, driving machinery, and other plant necessary for a mill, together with the drying kilns, mill dams, lathes, weirs, and watercourses, requisite for a corn mill, involved the expenditure of a considerable sum of money, such as only the baron could find. He therefore assured himself of a return on his capital invested by binding his tenants to use his mill. Of course, he got a good rent for his mill, which was the manner in which the benefit arising from the bondage of his tenants found its way into his coffers. In the Roxburgh Ballads, Volume 3, 681, we have the miller's advice to his three sons in taking of toll. There was a miller who had three sons, and knowing his life was almost run, he called them all and asked their will, if that to them he left his mill. He called first for his eldest son, saying, My life is almost run. If I to you this mill do make, what toll do you intend to take? Father, said he, my name is Jack. Out of a bushel I'll take a peck. From every bushel that I grind, 
that I may a good living find. Thou art a fool, the old man said. Thou hast not well learned thy trade. This mill to thee I'll ne'er will give, for by such toll no man can live. He called for his middlemost son, saying, My life is almost run. If I to thee the mill do make, what toll do you intend to take? Father, says he, my name is Ralph. Out of a bushel, I'll take it half. From every bushel that I grind, so that I may a good living find. Thou art a fool, the old man said. Thou hast not learned well thy trade. This mill to you I ne'er can give, for by such toll no man can live. He called for his youngest son, saying, My life is almost run. If I to you this mill do make, what toll do you intend to take? Father, said he, I am your only boy, for taking toll is all my joy. Before I will a good living lack, I'll take it all and forswear the sack. Thou art my boy, the old man said, for thou hast well learned thy trade. This mill to thee I'll give, he cried, and then he closed his eyes and died. To show the popular idea of a miller's integrity, I may mention that the children in Somersetshire when they have caught a certain kind of large white moth, which they call a miller, chant over it this refrain, Millery, millery, dusty pole, how many sacks of corn hast thou stole? And then they put the poor insect to death on account of its imaginary misdeeds. Even Chaucer must have his gird at the miller, the miller was a stout carl for the knowns. Full big he was of brawn and eke of bones. That proved well, for over all there he came. At wrestling he would have always the ram. He was short-shouldered, broad, a thick nair. There was no door that he not would have of hair or break it at a reunion with his head. His beard, or any sow or fox, was reed, and there to brood, as though it were a spade. Upon the cope right of his nose he had a wart, and thereon stood a tuft of hairs, red as the bristles of a sow's criss. His nose thurls black were and wide, a sword and buckler bar he had by his side. His mouth as great was as great fornis. He was a jongler and a goliardis. And that was most of sin and harlotries. Well knowed he stolen corn and totten threes. And yet he had a thumb of gold pardee. A white coat and a blue hood wore he. A bagpipe well conned he blow and sown, and therewithal he brought us out of town. The thumb of gold has somewhat puzzled commentators on Chaucer. One thing is certain, that a miller has been traditionally credited with a broad thumb, and the little fish the bullhead is called the miller's thumb from a fancied resemblance. Every one connected with the navy knows what the purser's thumb is, from the legend that when serving out their tots of rum to the men, his thumb was invariably inside the measure, doubtless necessitated by the rolling of the old men of war, which resulted in a large profit to himself during a long cruise. And this seems to illustrate Chaucer's meaning especially as it occurs immediately after the miller's ill-gotten gains, 
that by putting his broad thumb into every measure, he made thereby gold during the year. But there is another and a kindlier explanation of the term, which rests on the authority of Constable the Painter, according to Yarrell in his History of British Fishes, when writing of the bullhead. The head of the fish is smooth, broad, and rounded, and is said to resemble exactly the form of a miller's thumb, as produced by a peculiar and constant action of the muscles in the exercise of a particular and most important part of his occupation. It is well known that all the science and tact of a miller are directed so to regulate the machinery of his mill that the meal produced shall be of the most valuable description that the operation of grinding will permit. His profit or his loss, even his fortune or his ruin, depend upon the exact adjustment of all the various parts of the machinery in operation. The miller's ear is constantly directed to the note made by the running stone in its circular course over the bedstone. The exact parallelism of their two surfaces, indicated by a particular sound, being a matter of the first consequence. And his hand is as constantly placed under the meal spout to ascertain by actual contact the character and qualities of the meal produced. The thumb, by a particular movement, spreads the sample over the fingers. The thumb is the gauge of the value of the produce, and hence have arisen the saying of worth a miller's thumb, and an honest miller hath a golden thumb, in reference to the amount of profit that is the reward of his skill. Any notice of flour would, of course, be valueless without an analysis of its constituent parts, which, as anyone can understand, will vary in different weeds. There can be no standard because of the difference of the soils on which it grows, a fact which is fully borne out by the following tables by famous analysts. Jago, in his The Chemistry of Wheat, Flour, and Bread, etc., Brighton, 1886, quoting Bell, provides the following calculations for the amount of fat, starch, cellulose, sugar, albumen, etc., insoluble in alcohol, other nitrogenous matter soluble in alcohol, mineral matter, and moisture, broken down for winter wheat, spring wheat, long-eared barley, English oats, maize, rye, and Carolina rice without the husk. Professor Graham, in a lecture delivered at the International Health Exhibition, London, July 3rd, 1884, quoting Laws and Gilbert, provides the following figures. For old wheat, water, 11.1%, starch, 62.3%, fat, 1.2%, cellulose, 8.3%, gum and sugar, 3.8%, albuminoids, 10.9%, ash, 1.6%, loss, etc., 0.8%. For barley, water, 12%, starch, 52.7%, fat, 2.6%, cellulose, 11.5%, gum and sugar, 4.2%, albuminoids, 13.2%, ash, 2.8%, loss, etc., 1%. Oats, water, 14.2%, starch, 
66.1%, fat, 4.6%, cellulose, 1%, gum and sugar, 5.7%, albuminoids, 16%, ash, 2.2%, loss, etc., 0.2%. For rye, water, 14.3%, starch, 54.9%, fat, 2%, cellulose, 6.4%, gum and sugar, 11.3%, albuminoids, 8.8%, ash, 1.8%, Loss, etc., 0.5%. Maize, water, 11.5%. Starch, 54.8%. Fat, 4.7%. Cellulose, 14.9%. Gum and sugar, 2.9%. Albuminoids, 8.9%, ash, 1.6%, loss, etc., 7%, and rice, water, 10.8%, starch, 78.8%, fat, 0.1%, cellulose, 0.2%, gum and sugar, 1.6%, albuminoids, 7.2%, ash, 0.9%, loss, etc., 0.4%. Messrs. Wanklin and Cooper, in Bread Analysis, etc., London, 1881, say that according to their analysis, this wheaten flour which is the flour commonly to be bought in this country, has the following composition. Water, 16.8%. Ash, 0.7%. Fat, 1.5%. Gluten, 12%. Vegetable albumin, 1%. Modified starch, 3.5% and starch granules, 64.8%. A comparison of these tables by well-known analysts shows us, if we only take the single article of wheat, how the grain varies. Let me now say something about the constituents of wheat in as simple a form as possible. The fat is of a yellow color and as far as is known, is not a particularly valuable component part. But as all fats are foods, of course it is of service. The starch in wheat is the ordinary starch of the best kind of commerce, and seeing that it forms the greater part of all breadstuffs, it naturally is an important element in them. In good, sound wheat, the starch granules are whole. In sprouted wheat, or that heated by damp, they are rotted, and consequently the starch they contain is changed more or less into dextrin and sugar, and consequently a difference is made in the food value of the wheat. Dextrin and sugar are small components of good wheat. The dextrin, no doubt, has a beneficial effect in small quantities, but not in large. Sugar, such as is found in wheat, affords the necessary amount of saccharine matter for fermentation. Cellulose is more useful to the plant than to the miller, to whom it is as so much bran. There are two kinds of albuminoids, or gluten, present in wheat one insoluble, the other soluble in alcohol. The former makes what is called a strong bread 
and the latter acts in bread-making on the former. And under the influence of yeast, it attacks the starch, converting it into dextrin and maltose. The ash of wheat contains principally phosphoric acid and potassium. Magnesium ranks next, then lime, silica, phosphate of iron, soda, chlorine, and sulfuric and carbonic acids. And with that conclusion of Chapter 9, I think we'll end this evening's reading from the history of bread from prehistoric to modern times. I had no idea the milling process was so complicated. It certainly makes me appreciate flour all the more. When next we return to this book, we get into the art of bread making and baking. So that's something to look forward to. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>